All right, I think it's uh, time to start. Um, welcome everybody to the Distinguished Colloquium on Biological Sciences and Climate Change. Uh, my name is Luis Betancourt, I'm Professor of Ecology and Evolution, and uh, this is a, a, a new talk series at the University of Chicago, um, uh, organized by the Biological Sciences Division uh, in collaboration with the Mansueto Institute for Urban Innovation, which I also direct. Um, so the, the aim of this talk, the objective, is really to uh, bring to our community, but also uh, host uh, a series of uh, very compelling talks on cutting edge issues of uh, research, but also of public communication and discussion on themes uh, where the biological sciences and, uh, and climate change come together and, and pose both challenges that are scientific and, and societal. So um, our objective with these first few talks, uh, if you attended the first two, have been to cover broadly issues of public health and today, uh, starting today, also biodiversity. And so um, we're, we're so happy that we have uh, Claire Kremen today with us from the University of British Columbia, one of the great experts in biodiversity and interaction with, with human systems. Uh, to, to get us started on that theme. And uh, without much, uh, much further ado, I'll pass, uh, I'll pass the words to um, Mercedes Pascual, who's a Lewis Block Professor of Ecology and Evolution to introduce Claire. So thank you both. Mercedes, please take it away. Yes, yes, thank you. Well, it's, it's a great, great pleasure, pleasure to introduce Claire, who I met many years ago when I was a postdoc. And, and it is a real pleasure. Uh, she has been leading the way on how to bring uh, really biodiversity science together with environmental challenges, in particular, how to develop uh, sustainable farming landscapes. So to the more formal sort of introduction, uh, Claire Kremen is a professor and president's excellence chair in biodiversity at the University of British Columbia, uh, where she leads the interdisciplinary biodiversity cluster. Before UBC, uh, she held positions at Princeton, then at UC Berkeley, where she was founding director of the Center for Diversified Family Systems and also biodiversity, uh, the Biodiversity Food Institute. And, the, and uh, before that time, she worked for over a decade in the field of conservation in Madagascar uh, with the Wildlife Conservation Society, also the Circus Society, and uh, she, uh, more generally, she worked with developing protected area networks. So she has received uh, for this work, multiple honors such as uh, becoming a MacArthur Fellow in 2007 and also receiving the Volvo Environmental Prize uh, Laureate in 2020. And so I will not take more time. I think that, uh, that <laughs> describes a little, a little bit of uh, everything she has done. And she will talk today about uh, this uh, triple Anthropocene threat. Thank you, Claire. Thank you so much, Mercedes, for that introduction, and Louis and everyone for um, inviting me to speak in, in this uh, colloquium. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and um, get the slideshow started. Oops. Okay, hopefully you're all seeing that correctly. So today I'm gonna to be speaking about how we can manage landscapes to reduce this triple Anthropocene threat. And I'm sure that in this colloquium and just you know from your general knowledge, you're aware that the news out there is not good. Uh, the, recent, um, in, uh, the recent international panel on biodiversity and ecosystem services in 2019 uh, came up with the alarming conclusion that about a quarter of every species group on the planet is threatened with extinction due to human act actions, um, and that um, ecosystem services, in addition, are at great risk with uh, huge impacts on humanity. And of course, there is a, a, a tremendous uh, connection between uh, biodiversity and the production of those ecosystem services, so it's not surprising that uh, both biodiversity and ecosystem services are at risk. Uh, and now uh, more recently, the 2022 IPCC six global assessment uh, has said very, very strongly that climate change is a major cause of species and ecosystem endangerment. 
Also, um, as we all know, there are huge current impacts on society. This is something that we everyone is, is painfully aware of. Um, and the projections that this global assessment has put forward um, are really dire for, for um, any increases um, in uh, temperature um, above 1.5 degrees centigrade. Um, so the news is not good. And, and we've referred this, myself and my co-author, Adina Marinlander, as the triple Anthropocene threat. Um, the issues of biodiversity loss and climate change are highly interlinked. There are many feedbacks between them. Uh, and there's also a common root cause, which is the unsustainable extraction of resources and of course the, our unsustainable consumption of resources as well. Um, but just as these two issues um, of climate change and biodiversity loss affect and exacerbate one another, we can find solutions that work for both of these. And in fact, the recent IPCC 6 global assessment also calls out the critical role of nature-based solutions for adaptation and mitigation of climate change. And this figure is rather complex, but what I want you to take away from it is that conserving and restoring through ecosystem-based approaches is a critical part of maintaining our ecosystems so that we can adapt and mitigate for future climate change. And I'm wondering, can you see my cursor? Are you seeing my cursor? Yes, okay, good. Um, and um, the, you know, so the, the blue arrows and the green arrows are, are important here. The blue arrows are what humans can do. The green arrows are the role of nature, um, adapting and mitigating and also providing ecosystem services. So it's critical that we um, begin to think about um, these nature-based solutions. Now in uh, this talk, I'm going to focus on agriculture. Um, it's a, it's um, only part of the problem, but it's a big uh, part of the problem. It's a leading contributor to biodiversity loss and it's a huge part of greenhouse gas emissions, about a third of them. Uh, so one of the big issues of course is uh, habitat loss and habitat fragmentation, which have tremendous impacts on biodiversity. Um, when we lose forest through deforestation, that's also a main contributor to carbon emissions. Um, but there are also many other aspects of agriculture that are important besides that. Uh, so when, uh, uh, when agriculture is responsible for nutrient and sediment pollution, it has tremendous impacts on freshwater and marine habitats and also engenders biodiversity loss. The use of agricultural toxins, such as all forms of pesticides, insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, et cetera, also have major effects on um, biological food chains and on biodiversity. And then more on the climate uh, side, uh, agriculture produces a huge amount of greenhouse gases also through livestock production, uh, which uh, contribute a lot of methane, one of the most potent greenhouse gases, um, also through irrigated rice um, and um, through the, the production and use of nitrogenous fertilizers, um, uh, which are both very, it's very, very energy demanding to produce and also uh, produce a lot of nitrous oxides. So um, changing agriculture with nature-based solutions needs to be a major focus, needs to be an important part of the solutions that we use moving forward for these, these twin problems. So um, the working lands conservation concept is an example of nature-based solutions. And what do I mean by this? What I mean by it is uh, protecting biodiversity in spaces shared by people in nature. So within these, the human uh, dominated matrix within farmlands, within forests that are um, managed for human, uh, for production of, um, of timber and uh, energy and, and fibers, uh, in rangelands that are managed for producing livestock in all of these places, we can also protect biodiversity. Uh, and we can manage these landscapes in sustainable ways. We can use these nature-based solutions. And the aim is really to produce a multifunctional basket of goods. So this is a sort of a spider diagram and the way to read it is to look at all these, the elements around the exterior here and to think about, we want, uh, we want this to be well filled out. We want, we want to be able to produce all of these things. We want, to, we want production. We want to be able to 
have forest products. We want to have livestock products. We want to have crops, but we don't want to do that at the sacrifice of our ecosystem services. Instead, we want to sustain our ecosystem services because fundamentally those ecosystem services are what allows us to continue producing those things that we need and is what allows us to have uh, well-being. Um, and it also is important for our adaptive capacity uh, and resilience. Um, on the biodiversity side, we can manage these, uh, these working lands in ways that promote biodiversity, at least some elements of biodiversity, perhaps not all, but uh, quite a lot of biodiversity can be maintained in these kinds of landscapes. And we can manage these landscapes to promote connectivity as, as well, the ability for organisms to move across these landscapes so that they don't become impermeable um, boundaries that prevent movement and the adaptation of species um, to climate change. And biodiversity, as I mentioned before, is critical for sustaining these ecosystem services. So we have to think about all of these things together. So some examples of, that, of management practices that fit the working lands conservation concept actually date back millennia. For example, this is a great one, the Dehesa Forests of Spain. These are um, oak woodlands that have been managed. Um, they have a cleared understory through burning and clearing. And um, they're, they're, you can see they're quite well spaced out, these oaks. Um, and it's a habitat that uh, supports um, the production of quite a few different uh, food products like the black Iberian pig um, and a number of other kinds of um, very uh, specific varieties of, of livestock. Um, but also they produ it produces mushrooms, honey, cork, aromatic woods. And this has been going on, as I mentioned, for millennia. But these ecosystems also support some iconic uh, and threatened species like the Iberian lynx and the Spanish imperial eagle. But it's not just uh, these ancient practices, but also some much newer uh, management systems that fit the ideas that fit, fit the idea of working lands conservation, um, such as this push-pull system that was invented in Kenya in the 90s uh, by um, a number of scientific organizations working together the um, International Cent Center of Insect Physiology and Ecology, the Kenya Agricultural Research, Research Service, and the Rothamsted Research Center in the United Kingdom. And uh, what they did was to uh, create a system um, of growing maize in combination with a number of other plants that actually uh, solves two of the biggest pest issues that were decimating maize production in this region of Africa. That's the corn borer, corn borer uh, pest, uh, insect pest, and strigo weeds. And it's a very, very clever chemical ecology system um, for pushing uh, the pests away and for suppressing the strigo weeds. Um, at the same time, it also produces forage grasses and fixes nitrogen and makes a much more productive system. Um, and it empowers women by uh, creating um, multifunctional products um, uh, such as these, these forage grasses uh, that allow them to have greater milk production and greater income. So both uh, old and new kinds of practices can be used. In fact, there are many well-known practice, practices that support this kind of multifunctionality in agricultural systems. Um, and here I've arrayed them um, across scales from subfield or within the field to field to up to landscape scale. Uh, and what I wanna emphasize is three main principles um, of these multifunctional land use practices. And the first is diversification, which can happen over space such as mixed varieties, mixed crops, integrating crops and livestock, um, using compost or other soil amendments, organic amendments into the soil, all these things um, diversify the above or the below ground components of agriculture um, in space, but then also over time we have crop rotations, cover crops, fallow fields, and then moving up on the scale uh, around the field, we can include more of these um, semi-natural or natural elements like hedgerows or buffer strips, um, and include uh, riparian corridors, natural area patches, and have great heterogeneity within the landscape by having also woodlots and meadows. Um, and 
I think if you if you think of this thing all the way from the subfield up to the landscape scale, you can imagine a very mosaic agricultural landscape. There's lots of different types of crops. Things are changing over time. Things are changing um, uh, within small spaces up to large spaces. So that diversification and heterogeneity is key to create the kinds of synergies we need to produce the ecosystem services that farmers rely on, and that's nutrients, water management, soil management, pest control, pollination. And so now when you look at these, uh, this next part of the graphic, um, what each of these arrows, each of these arrows has behind it, uh, scientific literature that supports the role of the specific uh, type of practice or level of practice in helping to provide um, these elements. So you see there's an enormous amount of synergy. It, a single um, bucket of techniques has a lot of positive benefits. And the last principle is it's important is, is the regenerative nature of this. By supporting, uh, by through this heterogeneity, we're supporting the agrobiodiversity that's actually providing these ecosystem services and is the fundamental aspect of regenerative and resilient practices. So that was my introduction, this talk. Um, what I wanna talk about is, um, I wanna show you some examples, asking the questions, can working lands conservation simultaneously enhance biodiversity and ecosystem services while maintaining production and promoting resilience, including climate adaptation? Okay, that's quite a mouthful, but we will go through it all carefully and slowly. I will give you a couple of specific examples, an example from South America of silvopasture and, and several examples um, actually from your neck of the woods then uh, actually dealing with uh, North American Midwest farming and then go over some review syntheses to look more at generalities. The second part of my talk is about the barriers to adoption of these practices. And then I wanna speak about a promising avenue to scale up adoption of working lands conservation. And then the final part, um, quite brief though, is what working lands conservation could look like from landscape to global scales. And I wanna emphasize that I'll be drawing on work from many sources, many colleagues um, and uh, sources in the literature. It's not just my own work that I'll be speaking about. So for this first part, can working lands conservation simultaneously enhance biodiversity and ecosystem services while maintaining production and promoting resilience? including climate adaptation. So let's start with these intensive silvopastoral systems, which are widely being used uh, in different parts of Central and South America. Um, so um, what is an intensive silvopastoral system? Essentially what it is, is using a lot of different plants together as forages for these livestock. Uh, so you see here grasses, you see shrubs and you see trees and they're all actually edible. Um, by um, the cattle. Um, and this has important implications. The diverse forage improves the nutrition and health of the cattle, and it leads to high meat and milk production. But it has also many other aspects. The shading of the trees promotes animal welfare. Um, it stores carbon. Uh, and there are multiple strata in this uh, situation instead of just grass. And when you have more uh, vegetative strata, then it, it enhances the capacity to support multiple types of, um, of animals and plants. Um, and then there's a regenerative component as well. The manure from the cattle is going back into the system. Uh, the shrubs are nitrogen fixing. Uh, so they help with uh, creating the fertility in this um, in this system. And then some of these plants are deep rooted, which helps to draw the carbon into the soil. It helps to, through root exudates to create a more organically rich soil. Together, these are fertile and drought resilient. So let me go through some of the data and I'll be showing you a series of these comparative spider graphics. So um, here the, um, the grass monoculture is being compared with the silvopastoral system. I pulled together data from several sources um, and um, the way to read these graphs is uh, they're just simply comparative. Uh, so they're proportionally comparative. So let's look first at the ecosystem services for farmers. Um, as I mentioned, there are nitrogen, there's nitrogen fixation going on here. Um, and uh, because of this, the farmers actually don't have to use any fertilizers, uh, nor do they have to use pesticides. 
um, to control ticks because uh, there's natural tick control in this system. There's also um, significantly or quite a bit more a carbon sequestration than in uh, the grass monoculture system. Uh, so that's helping to provide this, these uh, more fertile and drought resilient soils. Um, on production and profit, there's really no contest. The silvopastoral system is far better. It's much more profitable due to higher daily milk production and um, greater daily weight gain um, of the cattle. And then from a climate mitigation standpoint, this is actually really quite impressive uh, because um, as I noted before, livestock are not particularly the friends of climate change. They, they produce a lot of methane, uh, but here there's, um, reduced methane pr production per ton of meat. It's probably related to the diet of the animals. There's also a much reduced land area per ton of meat. And that's important from a biodiversity perspective because um, the use of grains uh, for livestock, um, uh, the production of monoculture grains that is then fed to livestock uses a lot of land and is a huge contest with biodiversity. And so reducing that land area is really important. And then finally, on the biodiversity side, uh, this has uh, been studied for bird species and um, definitely there are a lot more bird species in these intensive um, silvopastoral systems than there are in the grass monocultures. Although that does not mean that they are perfect in any way if you were to compare them with a natural forest, uh, there are definitely species that would be missing, but they're better. So one of the interesting things about the silvopastoral systems, and here's an example from Colombia, is that they help to restore degraded land. So in the foreground of this diagram, you, or this picture, you see recently seeded grasses on compacted soils. These were soils that had been used uh, repeatedly for this grass monoculture. And now they're trying to bring them uh, back um, through these other kinds of techniques. Um, you see in the background, the kind of system that I uh, showed you diagrammatically before um, with, um, the, the shrubs and the trees and the grasses, they're not native trees necessarily. And then you also have here some silvopasture in, happening in the native uh, dry forest of the region. Um, and the biodiversity benefits are uh, multiple kinds of biodiversity benefits. As mentioned, it can provide habitat for certain species. We think that it may also help to rebuild uh, some connectivity in these landscapes. Um, here, this is the same farm, but shown some years later. Um, this is that foreground with uh, where they were restoring the grasses and the trees. Um, there's quite a few trees. Um, there's these patches here of the intensive silvopasture, and then the red patches are new patches they're starting. And you can see that uh, as these elements are added in that there's some connectivity being built in this landscape. And one of the very important things though, is that um, by, um, promoting livelihoods uh, through the profit mechanism um, and restoring uh, these degraded lands, it means that uh, people won't simply move uh, from a degraded place to a new place and degrade that one. So it's important for stabilizing uh, people on the land and preventing the expansion of forest loss and habitat loss. And this is um, anecdotal, but it, I think it's quite compelling. For some time now, I've been in contact with uh, Zoraida Kale at um, an organization in Colombia, uh, which is promoting this intensive silvopasture. And this was a quote from her a couple of years ago. She said, right now, the Cesar River Valley where the silvopasture is happening is enduring a terrible drought. And the only cattle systems that have more than enough fodder for the animals are the intensive silvopastures. Conventional treeless pastures will not survive climate change in the dry Caribbean region. So it really seems like it's something that we just simply have to do um, in order to have the adaptive capacity that's needed. So I'm moving on now to um, some examples from the US Corn Belt. And as you know, it's one of the most intensively farmed regions in the world, it's highly productive. Um, but it is uh, due to this production um, also responsible for a large dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico with tremendous biodiversity consequences for that region um, due to the, the effluents coming down uh, the Mississippi River. Um, so, but even here, it is possible to diversify. 
and um, adding these prairie strips into uh, corn soy agriculture on just 10% of the farm greatly reduced pollution and also enhances biodiversity. You can see here in the inset uh, what these prairie strips look like at ground level. Um, this is a work of Lisa Schultes Moore and her colleagues. Um, she just uh, received a MacArthur um, Genius Grant or Genius Award last year um, for her work in the system. Um, here's another one of uh, my spider grams, spider diagrams summarizing um, her work. And as mentioned, the pollution reduction in the system is amazing just by adding in these 10%. Um, um, of the field area in these uh, prairie systems, there is a huge amount of reduction in sediment losses, uh, in surface runoff, in phosphorus loss, and in nitrogen loss. And cleaning up those pollutants is important for those aquatic habitats. It's important for biodiversity um, in the freshwater system and, in, and ultimately in the marine system. But um, They've also demonstrated on their own fields uh, an increase in pollinator richness and abundance by about threefold and in bird richness and abundance um, by about double, including some species of greater conservation concern. On the production and profit side, uh, however, there is a loss in production, about a 10% loss in production by taking out the 10% of, uh, of those fields and, and uh, some loss in profitability as well. Um, nonetheless, for a small land area, huge benefits. It's important to say that the profitability on average, while somewhat less, was not significantly different, but it was nonetheless somewhat less. And this is a huge impediment for farmers in adopting these practices. I'll come back to that later. Uh, moving on to a, a different system um, that um, was uh, ex was. Uh, studied on an experimental farm in Iowa. Um, this is a model of integrating livestock into um, the corn soy rotation. So they didn't actually bring livestock into the system, but they, they uh, sort of simulated it um, by comparing the typical two-year rotation of maize and soybean versus uh, two longer rotations. Um, where they integrated uh, grains, um, which is a, uh, they, they integrated a forage rotation. So maize, soybean, and a forage rotation um, of varying complexity, either three year or four years. And so um, in their spider diagram here, um, first thing I wanna draw your attention to is the great reduction in inputs. Um, uh, when comparing the, the maize soybean, the two year rotation here in the black, with the other two, um, the longer rotations. Uh, so huge, in, huge reduction in energy use, and that's important obviously from a climate perspective, but also big, uh, big reduction in synthetic uh, nitrogen inputs. I forgot to mention that the longer rotations mimic the crop livestock integration in two ways. There's forage production, which livestock can then utilize, um, but there's also manure addition which if you had livestock in the system, that manure would be going back into the system. So they added manures instead of, they added manures. Um, they were also, this is a conventional system, so they were able to use uh, fertilizers and pesticides. Um, and what this indicates is that they didn't need to use very many fertilizers uh, because they were using the manure. They also used um, much less herbicide. And as a result of that, uh, the freshwater toxicity uh, was much less. Um, so great reduction in inputs, little difference in production and profit. Uh, in fact, uh, it was a bit more profitable. Um, I know the profits were, were the same, but it was a bit more high yielding for the longer um, rotations. And from a biodiversity uh, perspective, they did not measure biodiversity, but we could assume that the um, reduction in freshwater toxicity would be positive. This is not entirely pie in the sky. You might be thinking corn and soy and animal integration, is that gonna happen uh, in these intensive landscapes? But it's not entirely pie in the sky. Uh, there's a really nice popular book written by Brian DeVore who uh, found all of these uh, examples of innovative far farmers in the Midwest that are 
doing a whole wide variety of things. He called it wildly successful farming because the farming itself was successful, but they're also, um, these are people that are actually interested in stewarding wildlife and biodiversity on their landscapes. Um, and here, these farmers are um, doing a variety of things, rotational grazing, silvopasture to maintain oak savannas, or um, creating these diverse cover crops, including native plantings for, um, for pasture for animals. But in all cases, they're integrating crops and livestock, livestock in these particular systems. And uh, these kinds of different ways of farming that adding in uh, these more diverse rotations, using cover crops, uh, using diverse cover crops, and including prairie restoration. Here you see a, a prairie grass, you know, the roots are just so deep and you can see how that, how important that can be for generating these, these deep, rich soils. Um, the, all of these things are things that build healthy soils that are resilient to droughts and floods. And here's an anecdote um, that I wanna follow up with um, some hard data that's since been collected. So, or since been analyzed, I should say. So there was a, terrible drought in 2012 uh, in the Midwest. Um, and, and this farm here, uh, the farmer was managing it with, by, by doing a winter diverse um, cover crop. And he was able to continue uh, growing in, through that year. Uh, it wasn't a great harvest, but he had a harvest. Um, and this was his neighbor who was doing the conventional corn soy cropping, uh, no yield that year. Um, in addition, when rains came, uh, his, fa his farm was able to receive those rains and those rains could go into the soil. On this farm, the rain simply uh, created a hard pan and, and ran off. That's anecdotal, but uh, my colleague Tim Bowles at Berkeley has done um, a, a, a good comparison of um, 11 experimental sites in North America that uh, grow corn either in simple uh, soy, uh, corn soy rotation or corn corn rotation versus more complex rotations. Mm. And these uh, 11 experimental sites are long-term uh, projects. So there's 347 site years of data. And so what he's found um, first, um, overall, the more diverse rotations increase mean yields by 28%. Um, and this is in all conditions, whether normal conditions or drought conditions or, um, or flooding conditions. Um, and these are the different, uh, the, these are the 11 sites of, of these 11 sites, uh, nine of them um, had significantly enhanced yields um, when, um, when the rotation was more complex. This is a, an index of rotational complexity. So um, here are the way to read these graphics is that, um, if uh, the graphic is going across the zero line, there's no significant effect. If it's below the zero line, it's a negative effect and above the, and above the zero line, it's a positive effect. Um, interestingly, uh, they also looked, they also zoomed in on the stressful conditions, the years in which at each site, the most stressful conditions were happening and compared uh, the yields between the highest and the lowest um, rotational complexity treatments in those years. And there they again found um, that often uh, for quite a few of the sites, there were uh, significantly higher yields at the rotational, rotationally complex uh, sites. Sorry, rotationally complex, rotationally complex treatments. Um, and using actuarial records, they were able to identify which of these conditions were the drought years um, and they found that the most diverse rotations reduced yield losses by between 14 and 90% during these drought years. So there's strong evidence then from this study that diverse crop rotations improve yields and reduce crop losses under adverse conditions, particularly drought. So now I wanna turn from my examples to um, some synth synthesis work. Um, this is some of work that I've been involved with and I'm gonna give you the punchline first. Um, diversification practices, enhanced ecosystem services and biodiversity without reducing production. Because often we worry there's gonna be a trade-off. We do these diversification practices, we're gonna get better ecosystem services, we're gonna get better biodiversity, but we're probably gonna have a yield hit. That's what usually is the concern. 
So in this uh, study, what we did is a meta-analysis of meta-analyses, comparing diversified to simplified practices on farms. Um, so we had 69 meta-analyses. Uh, these meta-analyses um, collectively included over 38,000 original comparisons. So you see it's a tremendous collection or compilation of data. Um, and each study compared uh, a diversified practice to a conventional or more simplified practice. Um, the, diversification, the diversification practices, we bin them into these five categories of crop diversification, non-crop plantings, things like hedgerows or flower strips, that kind of thing. Um, organic soil amendments, reduced tillage, and organic agriculture. And here are results. Again, it's a meta-analysis read in the same way. Um, if it's crossing zero, it's not significant. If it's above the line, it is positive. Um, so here we see that for biodiversity and for all of the ecosystem services we looked at except climate regulation, we have a a positive um, significant effect um, of diversification on these ecosystem services. And importantly for crop yield, we don't see a significant difference. So we're not finding that it's reducing or increasing production and that that's important. Drilling into these results a little bit more, um, here we're looking at a smaller number of observations, only 24 meta-analyses those meta-analyses that were able to, that uh, dealt with um, the effect of the diversification practice, not only on the yield, but also on an ecosystem service, any of these ecosystem services and they're color coded here. And the main point I wanna make here is that we found a surprising number of cases in the win-win quadrat. In other words, the effect of diversification was positive on both yield and on the ecosystem service. There were more in that win-win quadrat than in any of the other quadrats. And uh, turning to a review synthesis of another lab group um, in the Charnsky group, um, here the, this was a uh, just a classic review, but um, there they dealt with these diversification practices um, sort of one by one. So um, you see these familiar list of practices, hopefully familiar by now: cover cropping, crop rotation, reduced tillage intercropping agroforestry, uh, structural elements means like adding hedgerows and that kind of thing. Um, and then some systems like conservation agriculture, mixed crop livestock or organic agriculture. The point is not on the details here, but for a whole wide range array of ecosystem, of ecological benefits, or in other words, ecosystem services. What I want you to mostly see is that most of the arrows go up. Most of the, most, mostly we have benefits here, um, most are fairly unambiguous. Um, when there's an up and a down arrow, it means it could go either direction. Uh, and the, the scaling here is um, white means very few studies, and then it ramps up to um, dark grays, the most, most evidence. Um, so in some, some cases, we have research gaps. Um, so mostly up arrows is the, what I want you to take away from this, and then this goes along with what I showed you earlier. Um, but one another interesting thing is that in this synthesis, they also looked from the economic perspective. And so looking at yield first, you'll see that there's a lot of complexity here, a lot of up and down arrows. So yes, there are trade, there are often trade-offs um, between specific techniques and yields, not always going to be a win. Um, but on the yield stability side, we see more of these up arrows and the long-term effects on yields are more of the up arrows when it's studied. And I think that that makes sense because um, you know as you build in more resilience into the system, then you are going to tend to have more stability. Even if um, you know you have a bad year due to bad weather, but if you've got more stability, that's that's important in those bad years. Um, and the profitability is also really interesting. You see mostly up arrows, and that's often because there are um, there can be savings um, to, that I as as mentioned in some of the examples before, less use of inputs, um, so the profitability some, uh, can go up for that reason, um, and then the risks can go down. So I want to sum up this section of the talk uh, about whether working lands conservation can can provide all these things at once. Um, the case studies provide some examples where multiple benefits are realized simultaneously. 
And the reviews and syntheses suggest that the results may be generalizable. So what are the barriers to adoption? Why don't we have more of these landscapes? Why instead do we mostly have much more simplified landscapes? Um, and, and I also wanna speak about a promising avenue to scale up adoption of working lands conservation. So the barriers to adoption are actually very well known. We know what they are. Well, what so, the, what we, so we've done a few of these. Um, Yeah, the barriers are very well known. Oh, and one of the principal ones is that uh, there are uh, upfront costs often to transitioning to any of these kinds of techniques and that, that alone can be a barrier. There can also be initial yield losses uh, as, um, as the transformation is happening. And um, so really, you know, you kind of, uh, you don't, and farmers don't always have access to credit. All of these would be uh, exemplified in the silvopastoral system which is um, quite a big ask to change to that from these um, simple grass monocultures. Uh, so getting started on this is not easy. Then there's just the change is hard and people are risk averse, but coupled with lock-in factors, like you, know, you may have sunk costs and big equipment um, and then economic trade-offs like the prairie strips definitely shows um, an economic trade-off. Um, the access to land, uh, if uh, people own their land, then there's much more incentive for long-term investment, but when uh, they don't own that land, then uh, th there can be little incentive for investing long-term because you'll just be moving to another patch later on. The access to labor can be a problem. In the mixed crop livestock system uh, that was done on experimental farms, I asked the authors uh, why, uh, given it's more profitable, it isn't being adopted more and in this, in that particular situation, it's because there really isn't the labor, the access to labor, the labor, you need more labor for that system. And it, nonetheless, it was still profitable, but without the labor, you just can't embark on this situation. Uh, a lot of these systems are more knowledge intensive. Um, and so they require training. It's gonna come uh, or extension, um, either peer to peer from farmer to farmer or from an NGO or government. Uh, extension agent and the push pull system would be an example of that it requires uh, it requires new knowledge to implement. And then having access to the appropriate equipment seeds breeds rural infrastructure uh, our uh, agricultural system has become um, quite uh, an hourglass figure where there is few uh, there are fairly few suppliers of equipment and seeds and and then things are um, uh, quite uh, not diversified. And so therefore it's, it can be hard to obtain what you need to do these correctly. And then the lack of incentives from policy or regulation. So um, a way forward, something that I'm really excited about and I'm starting to work on is the idea of identifying, retiring and restoring marginal lands within farm fields. And what do I mean by that? I mean that there can be um, small areas within the field that are less profitable. So I'm not talking about identifying big landscapes that are marginal. I'm talking about within a farmer's field or right around the borders of a farmer's field, um, if it works out that way. Um, lands that are less productive, let's find those lands. Because if you take those lands out of production, uh, then it's less of a hit to the farmer and it might actually be make their farm more profitable because in fact, Farmers farm their whole farm, whether it's marginal or not, and some of those areas are actually costing them money to farm. So here's some, some work that's been done on this in the United Kingdom. And here they're using, they use precision agriculture techniques to actually identify these areas within the field that are lower in productivity uh, because they have, um, you know, on the harvester itself, an ability to uh, with GPS to know exactly where they're harvesting from and how much they're harvesting at each point. So each of these points here has got a yield associated with it. And um, in this farming system, uh, they have there's many fields, this just shows one of them. Uh, they're doing a rotation of beans, oilseed rape, which is canola and wheat. Uh, and for each of these crops, they compared um, what was harvested in the outer edge, in this nine meter region of the outer edge, 
with a similar, similar number of points um, randomly chosen from within the field. And they found that uh, the edge production was significantly different for and lower for each of these crops. Uh, so that suggested that restoration, um, uh, that these lands are marginal, the edges are marginal, it could be due to compact, soil compaction. And that's where they should do the restoration. So they then did some of these uh, restoration plantings. Um, and you can see here one of their fields where they've integrated these pollinator habitats in the corners and along the edges. The corners can be more difficult to plant, so they choose those. Um, and then these marginal lands here. Uh, and they put either three or 8% of the field into these habitat planting and plantings on these less productive areas and compared them with control fields that were cropped edge to edge. And they had a number of different fields. So this was a replicated design. Some of the potential benefits they were thinking about uh, on the biodiversity side, pollinator and bird habitat uh, were what they were aiming for with the kinds of plantings they did. But ecosystem services that could result from this are pollination, particularly for the field beans, which are pollinator, are, are influenced by pollinators, pest and disease control um, for all the crops, water quality, soil health, erosion control, and carbon storage. And then on the economic side, um, the reduced inputs and in labor on the retired land. So if those lands aren't being farmed, then you're not using pesticides on them, you're not using fertilizer, you're not using seeds you're not running your machinery over them. That's, those, those are all reduced inputs. Um, the potential for increased yields on the remaining cropped area was a big hypothesis of theirs. How would these wildlife or these habitat elements influence the biodiversity and ecosystem services that might enhance crop production? And then the incentive or com compensation dollars for plantings can, um, is also, also happening in some places like in Europe, there are agri-environment schemes that actually pay farmers to add these in. So across all crops, actually, the production was significantly enhanced on the fields with the plantings. Uh, so here you see the 3% uh, treatment and the 8% treatments had higher yields in the remaining cropped area than the controls. And collectively, those were um, high enough enhanced production enough such that there was no difference in total production despite removing up to 8% of land from production. And there was also no significant difference in profits among the treatments. So here, the removal of lands um, that were most marginal uh, did not hurt the total production or profitability of the farm, possibly due to enhancements, um, particularly the field beans did have higher production um, possibly due to the enhancements of pollination services. And I can't go, I don't have time to go into all the details, but they have lots of data on that aspect. Could this work also for the prairie strips? Here's um, a, uh, a field um, during a, a high rain period, um, corn soy field, and they tend to um, manage the whole field the same way. But in fact, as you can see that there's a very wet area in the front and that wet area is not gonna do well. Um, so possibly if you put that, if you could identify those kinds of areas, um, then you might break even on, on uh, taking that land out of production in the good years and actually avoid losses in the bad years. Um, and Lisa Schulte's group has looked at this um, for the state of Iowa, they've, they've projected profitability in different years um, and looked at uh, how that changes sort of within fields. And so this is in a particularly bad year, 2015. Um, and if you kind of zoom in, you can see um, there's some areas that are kind of breaking even the zero to 200 range. And then there's some areas that are really doing extremely poorly. And if you could identify which of these areas uh, typically do less well each year, and you could take small areas out of production and put those into the prairie strips. That might be a promising way to go forward. So to sum up the sec section, um, what are the barriers to adoption and a promising avenue? Um, as I mentioned, there are many well-known barriers to adoption of more sustainable land management practices. We know what they are. Sometimes we know 
how to deal with them, but they're not, they're not easy. Um, this idea of identifying, retiring and restoring marginally productive lands within farm fields is exciting because it, it can align economic and ecological incentives and provide intrinsic motivation for farmers. So if you can um, help farmers do this profit mapping essentially on their farm, then they can go, wow, I'm losing money on this bit of my field. It wouldn't be so bad to put that into habitat. Um, and this is actually, is actually happening in, in some places um, in Canada. There's several NGOs that are um, doing, that are working with farmers now on this, but it still is hard to get started. It still takes some incentives um, to help them um, with these upfront costs um, and, and to try to get these lands um, into a restoration. So what could this working lands conservation look like from landscape to global scales? This is some um, uh, work with uh, my colleague, Lucas Garibaldi, and um, he uh, compiled um, along with a, a huge team, he compiled a huge number of studies um, to look at sort of what, what proportion of the landscape should be protected. And here are five, um, five examples um, of intensive farming systems, maize, canola, soybean, wheat, avocados, in these different um, countries. Uh, and this is a satellite image and what, it, what the landscape currently looks like. Now, if the target was about 20% of the land should be uh, conserved or restored to realize the ecosystem services and biodiversity benefits, that's the, um, that target came out of bringing together um, a huge review on this topic. Then how do we go about it? How would we get 20% of the landscape into restored or conserved habitat? So the idea is to start with existing areas, um, the existing areas in green here of habitat and build out from them. That's the first idea. Um, the second idea is to restore these marginal areas within the fields, um, also field edges and roads. And you can see that here illustrated here. And then, um, of course, making sure that sensitive areas uh, like rivers and wetlands, um, steep areas are restored and, and buffered. And then you also want to promote connectivity in the landscape to try to get some to help them um, with this aspect um, of, of movement. So this is a very local scale view. Um, thinking about it at a global scale, um, in my lab recently, um, we have done a global scale analysis of the connectivity of the world's protected areas um, using um, mammalian movement to actually identify that um, the level of connectivity that we currently have. And, we've, and in this process of this, we found that um, there are many uh, critical linkages um, that, and many of them are not protected. So about two thirds of them are not, are not protected. Um, the critical linkages are shown here from a mammalian move, movement at a global scale. Um, a lot of them are also in agricultural lands, about 30% of them are in agricultural lands. And so um, these are places where protection might not be possible. They're already in a working landscape, but here working lands conservation may be effective instead to try to build back this connectivity that we need, um, especially for mammals. And connectivity, uh, again, to bring together that linkage between biodiversity and climate change, it becomes more important with climate change. We know connectivity is already important to maintain populations, maintain gene flow, prevent local extinctions. But with climate change, um, you know, we have our current habitats and those habitat, those uh, or current climate niches, we should say, and uh, where are those climate niches gonna end up on the landscape? They may be somewhere distant, how are the animals going to get there or the plants for that matter? Uh, so we need these connected, we need to create connected landscapes. And that's really where I think working lands conservation is very important. So I want to sum up now. Um, and I think I've given you many examples uh, that show how diversified land management techniques can support this multifunctionality for biodiversity, ecosystem services and production, and can also promote resilience. The meta-analyses and syntheses support some generalizability of these specific examples. 
There are lots of barriers though to preventing broader adoption, but restoration of marginal lands is a promising avenue for scaling up adoption of working lands conservation. And we should aim for conservation and restoration of at least 20% within working lands and use working lands conservation to create permeable landscapes focusing on the most important movement linkages and climate connectivity. <clears throat> I hope I've convinced you that we can and must work on these problems of climate change and biodiversity simultaneously. And we mustn't of course forget uh, that resource consumption driver of climate change and biodiversity loss. It's not just about the land management, it's about the consumption. Um, I think that we actually really know the answer there. With that, within the food domain, the answers are clear. They're well known. We should be reducing food waste and meat consumption. We should be increasing fruit and vegetable consumption. All of that is better for our health. I don't have time to talk about that now, but I just didn't wanna leave that point out. Um, here, I focused on the nature-based solutions and working lands conservation and how they can provide great promise for replacing resource extraction with sustainable multifunctional methods that build our resilience and adaptive capacity so that we do have something to leave for future generations of diverse peoples and for biodiversity. So I wanna thank you very much for your attention and uh, hope I have a few minutes to take questions. Thank you, Claire. That, that was really wonderful and extraordinary in the vision of what it could be and what it should be. Do you have a few minutes for a few questions? I know we're about on the hour right now. Oh, uh, it's up yeah, to you. No, I'm happy to take questions. Are you? Great. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call on a couple of you, uh, Sean and Natalie in particular, I see on the, on the chat box. I, I sort of had a question about how well do we understand these ecologies, right? So some of them are ancient knowledge, some of them are practice. You gave us a lot of evidence from practice and experiments, but could we predict uh, an assemblies that have the characteristics to do all the things that you're thinking of, particularly under climate change, right? Where that, that prediction may be important. Can we predict the assemblies, like the specific- And the ecology, uh, exactly. And what, yeah, at the, at the systems level. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I mean, I think that we've got, I always feel like it's, you know, like ecology, of course, so con context specific and agroecology is no different. So um, I feel that to make this realizable on the ground in any specific context, we usually have to really understand that specific context. So we need to know, you know which crops we're dealing with, which pests, which pollinators, uh, and we need to tune it to that system. At the same time, I think we do have some generalizable principles. Uh, really, it's about the, um, the diversification of the agriculture at, from plot to landscape scale. It's just that that alone is probably not gonna be enough. You, can, you could unleash a lot of pest problems by not doing that more carefully. So yeah, we have to, uh, whether, you know, I think maybe we could predict functional groups, but I don't know that we can predict specific organisms. And I'm not sure I've totally answered your question. No, it's just it's just a general question. So I'm gonna call on uh, Sean, Sean Hoban. You had a couple of questions. Do you want to jump in? Great, I'll just ask one of them. Thank you very much. My question is about the meta-analysis section. Could you talk about publication bias in that studies might be more likely to be published if they find a win-win uh, outcome of biodiversity-friendly practices? Yeah, we did a huge amount of testing of every possible bias. Um, so I have to direct you to the paper because I, you know, I can't remember all the details there. But we were, yeah, we were worried about that. We were also there's another piece that was that um, we were worried about, and I think did a good job on addressing, which is that different meta analyses can use this, some of the same literature. So you have to make sure that you're not double counting. Um, so again, I'm going to direct you to that paper, the Tamburini et al. paper, um, to look in the supplement, which it goes through all that stuff in great detail. Great, thank you. So um, Natalie Diaz-Cruz, are you still there? Would you like to ask your question? Okay. Sure. Let me put on my button. Thank you for this brilliant I wanted to know if you have involved in your research or if you have thought 
uh, about involving to research the variable of using um, MGO seeds instead, or uh, native seeds instead of MGO seeds uh, for the crops. Because we also, like I, I, I guess, was uh, Sean uh, who talked about or who wrote about this um, change that we need to to do in, in in the complete system, like apparently. So I I want to know if that will be uh, a thing that you would like to address as well, or if you have already addressed that. Thank you. Well, I, I want to make sure I understood the question first. Um, you you were talking about native seeds versus NGO seeds? Yes. Meaning coming from a GMO, sorry, GMO. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was so a simple translation in my in my head. GMO. <laughs> yeah. Um so I um I don't I didn't really give any examples where we were talking about uh, so the GMO seeds um, might be part of the conventional comparison against which some of these diversified practices would be compared. Um, so are you asking whether the those comparisons would have also used the GMO seeds? Yeah, in terms of biodiversity. Uh -huh. uh, so if not, you already mentioned that uh, the, um, the multiplied crops or uh, that uh, mix the like the prairies or other plants with the usual crops are uh, and, and we can and we could see all the the benefits of that you mentioned that was benefit and yeah. we could see that but also i also would like to know if that benefits can also work in the crops that using gmo seeds i see okay or, yeah um well so a lot of GMO seeds, especially corn and soy, are um, are Roundup ready, meaning that you have to use herbicides for those seeds to even work at all. So I don't think they're completely compatible with some of these techniques, because um, basically, if you're dumping herbicide on the crop, then you wouldn't really. So the the corn soy system and the prairie strip. Those with those corn soy systems are using GMO seeds. The prairie strip is um, not going to get the herbicide on it. Um, so, but with the cover cropping, um, I guess I actually don't know if the herbicide would have persistent effects. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't really know the answer to that. <laughs> no worries okay. at all. I'm I'm just yeah. thinking as well about. These yeah. other variables. Thank you. All right. So okay. it, it is possible that I think it is possible you could use the more diverse rotations with the GMO seeds. Um, but yeah, this is the problem with talking about other people's work and not working in that system myself. I'll have to find that out. Uh, Mercedes, do you want to jump in? And maybe, maybe to, to, to close a very, very general question, because of course, uh, what we have heard and working land conservation in general. Is, is largely about restoring or at least uh, sort of changing the practices of agriculture in, in, in ways that uh, maintain ecosystem services and have other positive win-win uh, aspects. But at the global scale, of course, uh, an urgent problem is, is really land use change and deforestation. And, and you know, for example, the changing uh, of the Amazon at the speed that is, that is, you know, there is no time. So I was wondering how, whether you can close with some comments on what, how you see some of these uh, kind of signs, uh, you know, interacting with, you know, what could be done there to, to also, I mean, there is going to be consumption, there is going to be occupation of the Amazon, but, um, you know, how is that going to happen? I know yeah. that's a huge question, but I was wondering because this is very much about the agriculture versus the deforestation to begin with. Yeah, yeah I really think that, you know, my perspective is there should not be any more deforestation. We should not convert any more primary habitat, even secondary habitat at this point. We should not be reconverting that um, to agriculture. We should be we should be doing these kinds of techniques on the agricultural land footprint that we already have. There should not be any more deforestation and we don't need to deforest more. 
that that's kind of I think the deforestation that would be almost like um, uh, it's sort of the just the maybe the the easiest no brainer way just to expand instead of you know trying to use the lands that we've already got. The problem is we so many lands have become abandoned uh, agricultural lands because in the, and that's something that really doesn't get factored in when people try to compare these agricultural systems. And they will, they will say, well, we can't not do conventional agriculture because we have to feed the world. And that's because you know conventional agriculture, when you're dumping all these chemicals in, it's pretty productive and it produces a lot of food, but they're forgetting that at a certain point it gets exhausted and it can't be used at all and is abandoned. So that part of the land isn't feeding the world anymore. So we should be, we should be also taking into account that um, some of these lands are just getting sort of extracted away. Um, and uh, then people just go and cut down some more forests. So that those are the kinds of things we, we want to prevent. Um, so I think that you know having a more restorative approach to the way that we're using the lands that we use is really important. It's a long-term perspective um, that won't that won't stop deforestation tomorrow, but it has to be part of the perspective that will allow us to, to, to stop deforestation. We can't have this continued ex expansion and abandonment. It's like slash and burn farming mm -hmm. at a huge scale. Thank you, Claire. I think that that's an uh, important thought to, to stop and also we've gone a little bit over the hour, but we really, really appreciate uh, you know, your talk and spending time with us, entertaining our questions and, and inspiring us to think about these issues. So thank you so much. Um, you're always welcome here at the university. We hope to bring you in person in the future soon. Um, and um, thank you again and see you everybody next time. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, Claire. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.